1950 in June, I, we had just completed training at the Officers Training School in Quantico, Virginia, uh, when we were training reservists uh, from the various universities where, who were in the program for uh, the commissioning uh, as, after their graduation from college when we received orders to report to the 1st uh, Marine Division, uh, which was at uh, Pendleton, uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Uh, the Korean War had started and uh, the All these second lieutenants uh, were vying with each other to be the ones to go, but uh, a good half of the class of about 150, that made about 75, were assigned to the 1st Marine Division. Of course, the 1st Marine Division didn't exist because Congress had cut it, the appropriations so low that the Marine Corps only had about 90,000 people at that time. The 1st Marine Brigade, which was uh, essentially a 5th Marine Regiment, was already in Korea and were known as the 1st Marine Provisional Brigade. And we, they had only two companies, so we went to Camp Pendleton and formed the 3rd Companies, and we were shipped to uh, Pusan via Kobe by ship, and we landed in Pusan on the, about the 4th of September. They took the brigade up off the line, and we immediately staged for the Incheon landing. The Incheon landing was to take place on the 15th of September of nine, uh, 1950 uh, because of the critical situation down on the Pusan perimeter. There was little time uh, for any of the planning ashore. It had to all be done aboard ship. Uh, we had picked up our, formed our platoons in uh, companies in uh, Camp Pendleton. They, We'd had about a week and a half of training together, and we trained aboard ship going over, and we trained aboard ship going uh, up to Incheon. Uh, so we really hadn't gotten to know each other well. You don't get to know each other very well within in just a month, but uh, being that they were Marines, we knew what they were capable of doing. Uh, so we did what was unique in, uh, as far as I know, amphibious operations. We landed in Anshan and uh, had to land over sea walls, which uh, uh, required our, each boat to have a scaling ladder in the, in the boat. And uh, we would climb up over these ladders once the landing craft came up against the wall, and then we would go on to the beach from there, or up under the docks or whatever, wherever we landed. Um, and it was also unique in that uh, we didn't land until 5.30 in the evening. Usually an opera landing takes place early in the morning, but this took place at 5.30 in the evening because of the 28-foot uh, ti uh, tides uh, that they had in Incha. And we had to go up this long channel, and it had to be done exactly at that time or else uh, the landing would have to be delayed. Uh, so it was a little bit eerie. Uh, working at night and uh, moving in on the beach after dark and trying to take your objective. Uh, a big part, yes, we were taking fire, and uh, uh, but the air and the naval gunfire had done an excellent job of suppressing uh, most of the fire that was on the beach. Uh, but because of the unfamiliarity and lack of time to rehearse, uh, there was some confusion in landing the waves ashore. The, uh, there was one incident there where an LST was not aware that uh, we'd already taken our objective and they were firing on our own troops. Uh, but that was taken care of and uh, they, when they, they, they were firing right over my platoon when we were on the beach. And uh, some of the men wanted to return fire, but uh, that was discouraged. So. Uh, they got it stopped, and I don't think they inflicted uh, any casualties or very few, if any at all. Uh, we patrolled that night, and we consolidated our positions, and then went on from there. And uh, the opposition started getting stiffer and stiffer as we approached Sewell. Uh, of course, I can only speak for what, about the 5th Marines, which is my regiment. Uh, and we 
uh, had several counterattacks on our positions as we progressed, uh, um, but uh, the enemy suffered tremendous casualties. They either didn't know we were in certain spots or uh, they just uh, blindly came up and attacked without any intelligence. I don't know. Uh, but the biggest resistance was when we hit their main line of resistance going into Seoul. And uh, our battalion took one of, the, one of the hills. It took the whole battalion. And that night uh, on Hill 105, uh, the enemy counterattacked. And my platoon was uh, essentially was kind of overrun. But uh, the men didn't fall back. They stayed in their holes fighting. But the, you could see the enemy and hear them running by your, their holes. They came by so fast. Uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't too much illumination, therefore it was difficult to uh, really spot them in the dark. Uh, but the next night uh, we were in the same place and at the, exactly the same time uh, they pulled another attack, but this time we, they had moved up uh, uh, weapons that could fire the illumination uh, flares and uh, they were quickly wiped out. They were uh, concentrating on this one area, but it was. Uh, Is that your first uh, uh, contact with the Chinese? No, these were all North Koreans. We didn't contact the Chinese until we uh, got up uh, outside of uh, just north of uh, Ham Hung. Uh, this was just going into Seoul, and uh, after the Seoul operation, after it had been taken and. Uh, we were taken out on what was known as Operation Yo-Yo, which was the trip uh, to get into Wonsan, but they had underestimated the uh, number of mines in the mine minefield guarding the harbor. And uh, we spent in excess of a week just uh, cruising up and down the coast waiting for uh, the minesweepers to clear the minefields. There were so, so many there. It would have been quite, uh, quite a catastrophe or... Uh, yeah, it had we sent the landing craft in to the beach at that time. Well, they never really successfully cleared it all. They just cleared a path through the uh, Yes, normally that's what they do. At the ironic thing was that Bob Hope was waiting for us when we got ashore. <laughs> but uh, then we were sent out on uh, uh, patrols uh, into the interior to hunt down guerrillas and uh, retreating units from the south. We did run into them. There were some fairly... Uh, stiff engagements uh, when we did run into them. And uh, they were elements of various divisions that were coming up through the valleys, and we were supposed to be uh, trying to interdict them. Okay, at this point, didn't they capture a few Chinese, but they said they were volunteers, they called them volunteers? I don't recall when, if they ca captured any at Wonsan. Now, we, they, the first ch time I heard of the Chinese was up around Ham Hung. And... Uh, the 7th uh, Regiment of the 1st Division, 1st uh, Marine Division, was uh, uh, in the lead, and they had uh, they encountered several divisions of Chinese. And apparently the staff or the uh, G2 in Japan uh, and in our Corps headquarters didn't believe that the Chinese were there uh, other than a few uh, volunteers, unquote. Well, uh, 20, 10 to uh, Ten to 20,000 men, does, to me, doesn't necessarily reflect volunteers. Uh, but uh, the 7th Regiment did uh, essentially put out of commission close to three enemy divisions on that drive going up to the plateau. You have to realize that the, from Ham Hung and Hung Nam, they're, they're in a valley down by the coastal plains, and you have to go up a 3,000-foot pass to get up to the top of the plateau and then... I beg pardon? Uh, something like that. Uh, I can't remember. It's K-A-E-B-A-K or something like that. Uh, the, and once the 7th Marines uh, found all these Chinese, and uh, uh, they were not believed by anybody except the commanding general of the 1st Marine Division, G General Oliver P. Smith. And 
he tried to tell the corps commander and uh, the people in Japan that uh, the Chinese were in the war, but uh, they didn't believe they had enough intelligence to show that, in spite of the fact that the, it had been quite a battle getting up to the top of the plateau. So General Smith, as we advanced up the plateau towards the Chosen Reservoir, and so on the maps it's usually shown as Changjin, uh, Changjin Reservoir, uh, started planning way ahead because he had been told that we would progress up this one road. Well, the logistics were horrendous because the road going up to the top of the plateau was one lane. And there was, it was a, a terrible road. There was only one bridge. And once that bridge went out, uh, there was no way of getting back. He established uh, battalion strong points, starting one at the base of the hill, the next at Kodari, and next to one at Hagaruri, which meant was, were battalions from the 1st Marine uh, Regiment. And the 5th Marines went over onto the east side of the reservoir, and the uh, 7th Marines were on the west side of the reservoir. Uh, when we were on the east side of the reservoir, our company was sent out around Thanksgiving Day on a 10-mile patrol. And this was way up into northern Korea. We ran into people who told us that there were Chinese there by the... Uh, many, many, many Chinese. Uh, they didn't see numbers, but many, many. We went on this 10-mile patrol, but we did, couldn't, didn't see any more than about a squad. But after you experience this type of thing for a while, you, you have the feeling that's built in. Uh, you know they're there. Even if you can't see them, you know they're there. And here we were, 10 miles in front of our lines, and we knew the, the hills were just full of, uh, full of the Chinese. Uh, we couldn't confirm they were there except from what the natives had told us, but uh, we went back. We were anticipating to some extent that they were there because we could send out more and more patrols. Uh, but the Chinese were excellent at hiding. Uh, they didn't have the motor transport or things that A had to hide. They were just men that could hide in any of the ravines and in any of the valleys, and they were uh, very good at it. Uh, but then the Marines received orders to uh, attack to the east, so General Smith had to consolidate two regiments uh, I beg your pardon, to the west, uh, had to consolidate the two regiments, the 5th and the 7th Marines, on the, west, on the uh, west side of the reservoir. So the elements of the 7th Infantry Division of the Army relieved us in position, and we moved over to the village of Udamni. Uh, we arrived on the evening of the 27th. It was already dark. And our battalion was the last to arrive. Um, we were placed in reserve for uh, that night, uh, but it only lasted until about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, because at about that time, the Chinese decided that they were going to launch an offensive to drive us out of there. The Units uh, on the north, which were the 7th Marines, were in the hills. Uh, they were in the blocking positions because the 5th Marines were to attack to the, uh, to the west the first thing in the morning. But that night the Chinese attacked all uh, along the mountaintops, and the, they came in such tremendous numbers that they were in danger of uh, dislodging the Marines from these hilltops. Nevertheless, they, I beg pardon, 1282 and 1240. The, nevertheless, uh, Dog Company 7th Marines and uh, Easy Company 7th Marines were holding these two hills. Our battalion was advised to send uh, troops up to supplement uh, these two companies because they had virtually been uh, wiped out. 
Well, in doing so, they divided our company, which our company commander didn't like and which most people find uh, it's a detriment to the operation of a company. Uh, Two-thirds of the company, two rifle platoons with the company commander, went up on Hill 1282 to assist Easy Company. My company received, my platoon received orders at uh, 11 o'clock to go to the ammunition dump and pick up a, a unit of fire, which is the uh, supply of ammunition for a day's fighting for a company, and to take it up and go uh, up in Jordan Dog Company, 7th on Hill 1240. Uh, we got the ammunition and took off uh, about uh, uh, 12.30 or 1 o'clock. It was pitch dark. Uh, I didn't, uh, it was very difficult to tell where we were going, except we could tell by the firing that was going on exactly where we were going. Um, and we arrived just before uh, daybreak uh, and started up the hill. And uh, we found a few of the men... Uh, from Dog Company 7th uh, who were coming down that were wounded, and I got up close to the top, and I found a rented company commander and uh, about a dozen of his men that were left. You know, a rifle company contains about 220 men. And uh, we were told to retake the top of the hill. Well, we retook the top of the hill, uh, it, understand at this time that we had no artillery support, we had no mortar support, we had no air support. This was strictly individuals going across, up over this mountain and taking, retaking the mountain. Uh, we retook it and held what we took for a while, and then they drove us back for about 150 yards, but we kept that uh, hill in our possession for the, from then on. Uh, from where I was, I could look over at Hill 1282, uh, I believe, was that 1282, where the rest of my company was, and I could, from where my position was, I could see the Chinese massing and starting up the hill to attack that hill. And it was like looking on an ant hill that had been disturbed by somebody kicking it. Uh, it was just, uh, it seemed to be alive with Chinese. And at the same time, we were under intense attack, and I estimate that between one and two battalions were trying to retake this hill that we were on. Uh, fortunately, uh, sometime after noon, uh, there were the additional troops were sent out to join us, and uh, we were able to remain there. Uh, but it was frustrating because I had no communications uh, with anyone and uh, the so we couldn't get anything to support or I couldn't call fire for uh, on the Chinese as we were going up the other hill that uh, I, on that hill I, I went up with a machine gun section in uh, a full platoon uh, which amounts to approximately 55 or 60 men and uh, in the course of the day I lost about half of those people because of the constant attacks by the Chinese. We were under mortar and artillery fire. We were under intense small arm and hand grenade fire. They just kept... If they had taken Hills 1282 and 1240, I firmly believe that they would have cut everybody off in the town and you damn and anybody that was west of there. Uh, but fortunately, everybody did their, what they were supposed to do. And uh, the big thing was the cold. Uh, I don't know if anybody realizes that what the cold can do to the human body and the mind, especially the mind. Uh, you use about 60% of your fighting efficiency uh, once you get in uh, those temperatures. It was 25 and 30 degrees below zero. Uh, in the daytime, if it warmed up to 10 or 20 below it, uh, uh, we thought it was going to snow some more because it always warmed up a little when it snowed. But your weapons freeze, uh, the vehicles, the oil coagulates, the, uh, you can't stop your engines in your Jeeps, for instance, uh, which are absolutely necessary to maintain communications uh, because you may not ever get them started again. 
the men, after a few days of this prolonged fighting, were exhausted because every time we had to go somewhere, we had to go up a mountain. And it was exhausting. The uh, cold sapped your strength. And the one life-saving thing about the cold was if someone was shot, they didn't bleed to death because it immediately froze. But then plasma froze, too, if they needed it. The uh, UDAM, there were several units that were overrun. And when you get overrun, uh, it, it's kind of a whirling mass of people uh, involved in hand-to-hand, -hand and uh, uh, usually both parties are a little bit confused as to what's going on. But it's just a matter of fighting it out amongst each other. But no real actual deep penetration was made at Udamni. They managed, we managed to hold the perimeter. going through your mind is mostly reaction. Uh, the men know that they're gonna, possibly there's a chance of coming through, so each one has his own thing in his mind. They're not going to run, because Marines aren't uh, really made that way. <laughs> they're they're going to stay and fight. And what they do is they use their bayonets, they use their rifle butts, they use their fingers if they have to, to claw people and uh, anything to survive. And you wouldn't expect it from a civilized people, but these uh, young men, and they were only 19 years old, or on the average, or 20, and they, uh, they had a natural instinct uh, for survival, and this is what, how they were fighting. And they knew the man next to them wasn't going to go anywhere. He was going to be there fighting with him. And that was the big psychological thing, was you're there, you're there as a group. You're not there as one person. They swung everything they could get their hands on. They hit people with uh, frozen canteens. They hit people with <laughs> anything they could get their hands on. Uh, and usually, when that was happening, there was the company CP pers <coughs> personnel would uh, uh, were able to help contain it, and they'd reestablish their lines. And uh, but it, it's just uh, a real Donnybrook. And mix it up type of thing. I bet, and, and I guess a journal. What? Well, in 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 so, the platoon leaders normally cannot stay in their in their uh, holes too long because they have to be out there, be directing people, and he uh, the they can say what they want. I was a second lieutenant, but I think. Uh, everybody always makes fun of second lieutenants, but uh, I feel we j did just as uh, well as could possibly be expected oh, of. Sure you did. And uh, the whole idea is that they are responsible for coordinating these efforts, uh, and um, the the men look to them just like they do to their NCOs, and the, they all look to each other because each has a different type of experience. Each can, uh, each can help the other in with their experience. And, uh, and that's what they do. That's what they do in the Marines. They rely on each other. Uh, I saw one man, just as an example of his loyalty, he was shot in the throat. He went down to the aid station, got himself bandaged up. No artery was severed, so he brought, came back up on the hill and there he was with a bandaged throat, uh, still fighting with the rest of the people. Uh, this, that's uh, an example of how these people just won't quit. And that's what made the difference. They would not quit. Okay. This was on the night of the 28th? That was the night of the 28th, I believe it was, yeah. Okay. Um, and then we moved off of there. Go ahead, you had a question. Oh, and we went over, we were ordered to uh, withdraw 
and this is something that is not in necessarily in the uh, dictionary of the Marines is uh, to withdraw. But nevertheless, uh, we did. And since we did not have one person to coordinate the withdrawal, it was done as a joint thing between the two regimental commanders. And uh, the two of them coordinated the withdrawal back to Hagaru. When we withdrew off of Hill 1240 and Hill uh, 1282, we covered the withdrawal. We moved to just the other side of the reservoir and covered the withdrawal of the train and the troops as they started back to Hagaru. Uh, that night we were, uh, th this would be two days later, this would be about the 30th. Uh, the Chinese assaulted us across the reservoir and to show the intensity of it, there at that uh, one machine gun alone had 60 some bodies piled up in front of it. The closest was six feet away. Uh, so you can get the idea of how the Chinese assaulted in these positions. And I imagine the noise level was just totally oh. <laughs> Well, yes, there's no sleeping. <laughs> it is. Uh, but it's primarily small arms and 60 mortars because. Uh, it is most. It is the small units and the individual Marines that were doing this, uh, uh, this intense fighting. Uh, when we got back to Hagaru, we had to go back over the ridge lines uh, at night, and they were frozen with ice. They were they were ice and snow, uh, and so cold you couldn't believe it. You'd stop for a break, and uh, the, by this time everybody was exhausted, and the cold was exacting its toll. You had to sometimes kick a man to wake him up to keep him awake so he wouldn't lay there and freeze to death. Uh, but we managed to get them all going again. And we got to Hagaru, and for one, just that night, we, everybody was stuffed in a tent because that had been the command area. And uh, it was the first night's sleep we'd had in almost a week. And we, little things like trying to eat, you could put a can of, uh, food into a blazing fire and only the side of the can that was next to the fire would thaw and the outside the other half of the can would stay frozen and that's how how cold it was so uh, the our company found a lot of tootsie rolls large tootsie rolls i don't know where they came from but that's what we ate they didn't freeze uh, I ate the compressed cereal, which was dry, and sugar, compressed sugar, to keep going because everything else was frozen solid and uh, we couldn't build fires to thaw it out. Uh, anything that, that was not liquid you could eat, but uh, then you didn't have any water to, because everything was frozen unless you ate snow and that wasn't a, too advisable, but <laughs> the canteens were frozen. Uh, and we got into Hagaru, our company was given the an area to the north of uh, Hagaru on the perimeter. The it was almost a riverbed, and we were anchored on East Hill, where so much heavy fighting had taken place. And our right flank was facing a draw. And that night, the Chinese uh, attack. And this was ideal because it was so flat that. Uh, our fires could be set up the way it isn't a textbook. It's the only time I've ever seen it done that way, where your machine gun fires can interlock across about about a foot above the ground. And uh, this continued all night long, and the Chinese just kept coming into those bands of fire. And they, they tried to come up a draw into our positions, and we moved a tank in there, uh, and he just kept firing down the draw. And the next morning, the, uh, there were smoke, smoking uh, quilted bodies piled up all over the place in front of that tank. Uh, it's hard to imagine them coming on in the numbers that they did. There were hundreds of them laying out there dead. And... Uh, Of 
course, that night we didn't suffer too many casualties because uh, they didn't get in close enough for hand grenades or uh, except small arm fire. But it, it's just uh, scary when you see so many so many by people coming at you. They just look like a, a mob scene coming at you from out in the open. And you could hear them coming. They had whistles. Oh, they had the whistles. They had their bugles. Uh, and, uh, and many of the units would put out uh, trip flares or little cans of gasoline that would go off when they were tripped off and, uh, so that you would get a warning when they were coming. Uh, this, uh, by the time we got back to uh, Cordery and Hagaroo, I mean back to Cordery and down to Ham Hung, uh, the units were, were very depleted. It's, uh, Probably, from what I read, they say it was probably one of the greatest battles that's been fought by a military unit in this country. Uh, we didn't, we weren't, we were too busy to think about it as in that way. But we were determined we were coming back, and that was all there was to it. What was con disconcerting up to me later was the fact that my wife had read in the newspapers that, uh, and we hadn't been married but a year when this took place. And, um, my first child was born while I was in a uh, bean patch someplace west of Mons Wonsan. But the newspapers had the 1st Marine Division as having been annihilated. I, and needless to say, this uh, was not a welcome type of thing to read uh, back here in the States, especially to your wife and to the family. But uh, I didn't get, that, get the caller until I was two weeks later when I was in the hospital in Japan and I called her and uh, uh, I was so glad I did because she thought she had, that the division had been uh, totally wiped out. So and that was the mission of that Chinese army was, was to wipe out the 1st Marine Division and that was their sole mission. So were you wounded or you just recovering from everything? No, something, somehow the, the and this is that sounds weird but the uh, cold affected the muscles in my back and it essentially paralyzed me and I couldn't move I couldn't lift my weapon I couldn't do anything I had uh, and it come and go so when I turned in to get that treated uh, like everybody did at that time the moment you stopped and got near a fire you took your uh, your, your shoe packs off and tried to dry out your socks well, it was at that time that the doctor noted that my feet had turned black and that I better go to the hospital. My fingers and my feet had turned black from frostbite. So I spent th uh, three months in the hospital in Japan recovering from that. And uh, that was the reason I was evacuated. And I always get kidded because my, my, my family said I got cold feet <laughs> when I left Korea. <laughs> Between Hagaru and Cordery, we had, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think the 5th Marines had the rear guard going out of there. Uh, the big problem was the civilians. Uh, there were thousands and thousands of civilians following our the train on the road. And we knew that in that bunch of civilians, there were armed, per, armed enemy personnel. So the, we, what we had to do was to keep them off. And sometimes we had to fire some shots over their heads or what have you to keep them away from our train because uh, the uh, Chinese and the North Koreans, uh, they changed clothes without batting an eyelash. And we just didn't, we didn't want them in mixed in with, it, with us. And that would also hinder our ability to move around and maneuver and what have you. Um, I guess going from... Hagaru to Cordery was uh, it it was uh, about as intense as it was at Udamni. 
I guess the Chinese realized that we were uh, on the way out and they were determined they were going to stop us. But uh, there were some units that were down to uh, NCOs being company commanders. Uh, there were units that were almost ceased to exist by the time we got to Coterie. And uh, part of those units had been caught in what was known as Hellfire Alley. They had run the, uh, tried to send a supply train from Coterie to Hagaroo. Uh, I don't know how many about a hundred and some vehicles along with the British commando and uh, a, a company of army troops and George Company uh, uh, First Marines. And they, about halfway between, they got, and they also had a platoon of tanks, but the Chinese, uh, I can't say they ambushed them because they were fighting their way all the way from Cotorita to Hagaru, but they managed to stop them about halfway and they proceeded to uh, chop up the convoy. Now parts of that convoy did reach Hagaru and uh, the Royal Marine Commando, uh, the British Marines, that was Colonel Drysdale, uh, he was the commander of that task force. I think it's referred to in the books, history books as Task Force Drysdale. Um, He, uh, he managed to survive with about half of his Royal Marines, and some of the units turned back to Cordery, but this, uh, about half of it, at least, did not make it either direction, uh, because they were simply overrun by the Chinese. What, what do you know about Task Force Faith? Task Force Faith uh, were the, comprised of the units that relieved our uh, regiment on the uh, east side of the reservoir. Uh, they came over there and assumed our positions. I guess they assumed our positions. Uh, I don't remember. It's been, it's been so long. But I do know that uh, they were spread out for quite a ways. Uh, they had two battalions, and we had three battalions over there, uh, where their, their other battalion hadn't gotten up there yet. And after we left, from what I understand, uh, there was two battalions plus their artillery support uh, ceased to exist as fighting units because of having been run overrun by the Chinese. Now, what, why and it happened and how it happened, I really don't know except what I've read. As far as I can tell, no, there wasn't anyone to send up there. You take Hagaru, which was in the clearest place, had one battalion of Marine infantry, had the engineers were trying to make an airstrip. They didn't have enough troops t at that strong point to uh, 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 make sec the, that perimeter secure. Uh, they had cooks on the lines, they had clerks out on manning the perimeters, uh, the engineers were trying to get this airstrip done so they could evacuate casualties, uh, and they worked day and night under fire, and the Chinese were up on East Hill, which commanded the whole area, and that was contested the entire time. I don't know where they would have gotten any reserves to send up the aid task force faith. Uh, what happened, those two battalions and that, from what I read, only had about 160 survivors each out of each battalion, which usually comprised about 2,000 men. The, our Colonel Beale, who was our motor transport officer, uh, on seeing uh, survivors coming across the ice took his men in jeeps and trucks out and picked up these survivors who were wandering around out on the ice in the days. They were wounded, and he brought them back to the Hagaru perimeter. He, some of his people, Colonel Beale's people, took jeeps and trucks up and checked out the 
trucks that, that had been loaded with wounded from those two battalions. The Chinese had overrun those trucks, apparently, and uh, had killed all the wounded that had been in those vehicles. I don't know how many people survived that the Colonel Beale and his uh, motor transport people brought out. I think there's something like 200 or 300 people. Uh, Colonel Beale was a veteran of World War II. He had been in the Corps, oh, uh, I think uh, close to 30 years. He was an elder, older man, and uh, you can imagine if he'd been in 30 years, he went out on the ice himself and was helping bring those people back. I met him in San Diego. But uh, you don't talk about those things normally. Uh, you, just, you accept them, and uh, when we met him, uh, somebody said he was a CO Motor Transport Battalion, and you said, okay, we recognize what he did. And, uh, you, you, the first time anybody that I know of ever spoke about or talked about the Korean War was when uh, the Chosen Few started their organization, and these were the survivors of that episode. And uh, once they got together and started talking about it, they started finding out about what went on, because the veterans that came home, they never spoke about it. They didn't talk about it to anyone. Nobody asked them anything about it. Uh, it was a war that uh, the men came home. Somebody said, where have you been? They said, Korea. And they said, where's that? And uh, so the veterans of that war came home. They went about their business, and that was it. And uh, you won't see it mentioned anywhere, but if you stop to look at the intensity of that combat and stop to figure that in the three years that the Korean War went on, they suffered as many uh, killed in those three years as the entire Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese War, which was 10 years approximately. Some of those battles had more casualties than, say, the Normandy had even. Yes, the, uh, I can't remember how what the casualty was, uh, numbers were, just for the chosen operation. Uh, but I would uh, estimate there were about uh, counting frostbite, which you cannot discredit as a uh, casualty because it's you're ineffective. Uh, there are probably in about 10,000 casualties. And uh, that's a lot of people. The, to add a little bit to the cold, people would hold on to a hand grenade and uh, uh, find out later they couldn't let go of it because their hand was frozen around a hand grenade. Uh, carry a stretcher down off a mountain, holding, gripping onto a stretcher. Uh, you find out you can't let go of the stretcher because your hand's frozen. Uh, these things are things that happen. They, I can't stress how, how much the cold affected people and how cold it really was. Uh, walking down the roads or the mountains with those shoe packs on, no matter what you did, your feet were cold. I could feel the ice slivers going up and down between my toes when I walked, uh, because your feet never stopped perspiring. They, uh, even though, and these boots did not breathe. They were just solid rubber. And you have to have something that breathes to let the moisture out. Uh, I think a lot of books were written about those experiences in cold weather operations and what have you, and I think uh, we learned a lot, but it was a, quite a cost. I don't know what else I can say unless you have some questions. Uh, Mr. Dollar, it, it, <laughs> uh, business, uh, when you first came back in the States, no one seemed to know anything about what you just been through. Is that, is that right? Nobody seemed to know very much about uh, what was going on or what had gone on. Uh, I don't. Maybe it was anticlimactic because of World War II just having been over for four years. Uh, but I do hope that they never. And this isn't a political thing. This is just my belief that they should never uh, decrease the size of military units 
to the point that they were at the beginning of the Korean War. Would you care to say that one more time? I just, I just hope that uh, we learn something uh, so that they don't decrease the size of the military services to the point that they were during, at the outbreak of the Korean War. You stop to think that the Marine Corps had two divisions they had to maintain, which normally run with supporting arms about 20,000 people, 20 to 25,000 people, but yet the Marine Corps had to maintain a battalion in the Mediterranean. They had to maintain guards in all the embassies around the world. They had to maintain uh, units on Okinawa. And yet, when the Korean War started, MacArthur immediately wanted a Marine division. Well, if people stop to think that that first one division required the movement of Marines from all over the world to make up that division between uh, the end of July and the 15th of September. They went from embassies, they went from guard duties. They went from every post imaginable. And the one of the main life-saving factors was the fact that the Marine Corps stressed training. Even no matter where you are, they have to train. And these people were reasonably well trained. I felt so sorry for some of the Army troops that were sent from Japan to the initially to the Pusan perimeter because they were kind of fed into a grinder. And uh, I, that's not my opinion. I've read that many times. Well, it's true. It is. But the Marines have always stressed, train, train, train. And regardless of where you are, the smallest unit, 10-man unit, they'll train. And that's what they've done. That's so true. That's so true. I'll tell you uh, <laughs> Yeah. So I, you know, I know exactly what that is. Let me uh, check this tape again. I'm not sure I want to do that. Okay, we got, we got about 11 minutes left on the tape. Um, okay. Anything you want to say? say I, I just want to say one thing that what the Marine Corps did do once we got, had that experience was. They established what was known as an escape and evasion school up in uh, Pickle Meadows in California. And well, not long after I came back, I was, a, uh, or it was, it was about five years after I came back, I was given a rifle company, and we went up there for winter training. Uh, up in Bridgeport. Up at Bridgeport, California. And uh, I swore I never wanted to see snow again. <laughs> Cold, but uh, we went up there. And uh, it was excellent training. And I no more got back to Camp Pendleton. They sent me back up again as a umpire for the next group that went up. Uh, but I don't mind cold weather because it doesn't affect me unless I stay out in it quite a while now. And uh, I hope that someday that they are able to develop the proper equipment for fighting for in cold weather because it uh, wasn't there when we were there. The mummy bag was about the best thing we had. <laughs> I don't know what else I can tell you. If, uh, that's, that's a quick rundown of... Uh, that, that's, uh, have you done this before? I beg pardon? I said, have you done this before? No. Uh -uh. There was one, uh, one kind of funny thing. A lot of things were funny, but this was funny. We were, uh, I mentioned Hill 105 going into Sioux, and uh, two men showed up and said they were lost from their unit. And uh, they were assigned to my platoon, and that, that night was when the enemy attacked my platoon positions and ran through us, and uh, uh, it got kind of hairy there for a while. And, uh, the next morning, these two came up and said, we want to go back to where we came from. We're sailors. And we wanted to see uh, what it was like to be in the Marine Corps. We want to go back to our ship. <laughs> and they left. They didn't want to come back with us. But uh, and the people 
there's so many people that did their job. If one unit had not done their job, possibly the rest of us would not survive. But uh, everybody did their job what was expected of them, and uh, I think that's why we got out. That's an amazing story, Mr. Dodd. Well, it's, it's amazing. I, I really don't know what to say. Well, uh, have you thought about this over the years? What, what did you learn? What is the most important thing in life? I'm sure you know. Well, one of the things I've learned, aside from the, the, is that people who go through a situation such as that and experience those things together. Uh, creates a bond that uh, can never be broken. Uh, that is why we had organized the chosen few. And those people uh, call themselves a band of brothers. And it's because of what they experienced together that nobody else has experienced. And, uh, and it teaches me that the people properly motivated can survive. The way those people, those men were being Marines and being proud of themselves and their organization. What, what, what have you done? Are you retired from? I beg pardon? What, what do you do for them? Are you retired? I'm retired now. Retired. Yeah, I retired from the Marine Corps after 20 years, but uh, uh, I had the opportunity during those 20 years to command every type of company in the 5th Marines. I commanded a, not only the rifle platoon, but a rifle company. I commanded an H&S company, I commanded a regimental headquarters company, uh, and I was able to experience each and every one of them, uh, and I enjoyed that. Uh, and I believe that any people properly motivated will do anything. Did you have any hard feelings towards the Chinese? About what? The Chinese. About the Chinese? No, they were doing their job. Uh, you don't have time to hate. Uh, the Chinese were just somebody that either they kill you or you kill them. You know, you really don't have time to hate them. They, people that were, just out there. they were just people out there that if you didn't shoot them, they shot you. Uh, hate blinds you. If you hate somebody, you're liable to do something stupid. <laughs> You've got to think logically. Think of them as uh, something that has to be eliminated, or else you're eliminated. And that's all. That's a simple part of war: is uh, uh, is to eliminate the will to fight on the other side, so uh, that's what we were hoping to do. <laughs> Many Chinese did give up later to, toward the latter part of that operation because they were frozen just like we were. Uh, I saw them with cakes of ice on their feet. They were only, were only sneakers. They crossed the, water, the creeks of the rivers and, uh, in those sneakers and they never had a chance to dry them out. They, the water just freeze solid on them. And they died uh, from the cold like everybody else. I guess they must have had tremendous casualties from the cold. Well, you've got about two more minutes you can say anything you want. <laughs> to anyone you want. No, the only th thing I have to say is uh, uh, those, those young men that uh, were in those units, they were all regulars except the, in the 7th Marines, and they proved to be just as good as the regulars. The 7th Marines were made up of reserve units primarily that had been called up about 50-50. And uh, I can't say, say enough about them. I can't, I, I can't think of anything else, Mr. Dodd. It's been <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, well, let's, you want to take a look at some of this? Sure. Okay. And, uh,